The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Innovative Therapy for B-Cell Malignancies, a master class and tumor board on decision-making in CLL, FL, and MCL. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RZK860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Well, good evening um, and welcome to this program entitled Innovative Therapy for B-Cell Malignancies, a master class in tumor board on decision making in CLL, follicular lymphoma, and mantle cell lymphoma. I'm Ian Flynn and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Ryan Jacobs and Dr. Gia Ruan. And I'm going to start out with just a little bit of overview. Um, I think it's uh, not lost on this uh, audience that uh, there are many new therapies for patients with B-cell malignancies, and that's important. Um, this year, there's estimated to be in excess of 20,000 new cases of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and almost 75,000 new cases of patients with lymphoma. And of course, the biology and the natural history of these diseases will vary according to the cell of origin and, and the biology of the, um, of the underlying malignancy. But thankfully, we have many new, um, new therapies for these patients, including BTK inhibitors, PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, BCL2 inhibitors. We're seeing some next generation CD20 monoclonal antibodies as well as IMIDs and finally CAR T cell therapy. And we're gonna walk you through some of the data that supports their use in the different, um, in different malignancies this evening. Some of the first new therapies um, for lymphoma and CLL came out about 2013. That, that was with the initial approvals of lenalidomide, idelalisib, and abrutinib for mantle cell lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We've seen other approvals, such as um, venetoclax and acalabrutinib for CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. Um, recently, in the last year, we've seen approvals of copenlisib and duvalisib for follicular lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, as well as CAR T-cell therapy for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And just in this year, we've seen some important data come out in phase three data on the upfront uh, treatment with abrutinib through the ECOG and Alliance trials. And there's important phase three um, data with acalabrutinib and CLL. And we've had the approval of um, the R-squared regimen um, from the AUGMENT trial in relapse from re in refractory follicular lymphoma. And finally, a very important combination therapy of venetoclax and abinutuzumab as frontline therapy for patients with, um, with CLL. And we're gonna touch upon all these um, this evening. And with that, we're gonna move on to, um, to follicular lymphoma and, and talk about chemo sparing options as a path forward in follicular lymphoma. So let's start out with a case. This is uh, Michael, who's a man with, um, with uh, flick lymphoma. He's diagnosed with symptomatic flick lymphoma at age 62. He has a classic immunohistochemistry um, on um, pathology. He's symptomatic, he has B symptoms, and he has bulky lymphadenopathy with at least one tumor mass being greater than seven centimeters. So clearly he um, makes the treatment re recommendation by the GELF criteria. Um, his, he and his physicians elect to treat him with R-CHOP, um, followed by two years of maintenance with, um, with rituximab. And he achieves a response and, and is, um, is disease-free for a couple years, but uh, two years after ending maintenance therapy, he, um, he progresses. Now, um, R-CHOP was not easy on him. He did have a number of the predictable toxicities that you see with, with uh, chemotherapy, including neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, neuropathy, as well as alopecia. So now as we move on to thinking about what to do next for this patient, it's important to discuss with this patient, and, and certainly the, uh, Michael remembered the, the, his earlier experience with, uh, with uh, rituximab and, and CHOP. They, they included the neutropenia and febrile neutropenia, as well as neuropathy. And so this colored his, uh, his thinking about what to do next, as well as his physicians. And based on the phase three augment trial, the R-squared regimen is an option that addresses some of this patient's concerns about toxicity. And Michael goes on to achieve um, a response with R-squared and he remains in remission for more than two years. After three years, um, Michael shows clinical signs of relapse with progressive disease, um, which is con confirmed at a clinic visit. You know, at this point, there's a number of options for this patient. He could go on to receive perhaps more R chemo, um, or you could consider a transition to another chemo-3 regimen. So in this case, um, the PI3 kinase inhibitors are one such option. There are now three approved 
um, therapies for this patient. They include adelisib, which is an oral agent. More recently, duvalisib has been approved, another oral agent, and copanlisib, which is an IV PI3 kinase inhibitor. And this patient um, decides on duvalisib and is initiated at the standard doses of 25 milligrams twice a day. So a couple thoughts before we go on and talk about some of the data. Um, this patient could have received bendamustine and rituximab um, in more recent years. So after the BRIGHT trial as well as the STILL data, I think in the U.S., BR has become a more, one of the more common frontline options for patients with follicular lymphoma, although they, have, um, they both have their own toxicities, but somewhat different. And the other thing is this patient received rituximab maintenance. And of course, that was very common. If you think back, if you just do the math, this was probably, what, eight or nine years ago this patient was receiving these treatment. Um, and, and rituximab maintenance was very common in that era and it's still used, but it's just a little bit less based on the, the lack of, well, it's certainly an improvement in progression free survival, but a lack of overall survival seen with that approach. And I think one of the other important considerations is in, for the physicians treating this, this patient is about sequencing these therapies. It's important to, th to start think out up front how you're ultimately going to manage the sequence as almost all these patients will ultimately relapse at least once or twice. Let's go through some of the data moving beyond uh, immunochemotherapy and follicular lymphoma. One of the important treatment decisions for any of our patients with follicular lymphoma is you know, in, in deciding what therapy is. Of course, there are comorbidities. The grade of disease, is this grade one, two, or is this grade three? How aggressive is the disease behaving? And of course, of course the goals of treatment and patient pref preference. The individual items within the job criteria are also important in, in, um, in making uh, treatment decisions about which therapy to choose. This is the NCCN guidelines for the treatment of follicular lymphoma. On the left, you can see is the first line therapy, and there's many um, different options here. Chemoimmunotherapy also included is um, the R squared regimen, which is based on the relevance trial as well as in some patients it's still appropriate to use single agent rituximab. Now as I mentioned, it's becoming less common to use um, s some of the maintenance therapy, but certainly the maintenance therapies are, um, are reasonable in, in patients as well and include abinutuzumab as well as rituximab and less commonly um, radiomyotherapy. Now when we get beyond frontline therapy, there's a whole host of different um, treatment options. You could go to chemotherapy, perhaps one of the regimens you hadn't used as front uh, in the frontline setting. You could use the R-squared regimen, or, or you could use um, some of the, the PI3 kinase inhibitors as you get farther down the treatment, uh, treatment paradigm. So let's talk about um, the R-squared regimen. This was recently FDA approved for patients with relapsed, um, relapsed follicular lymphoma. Um, that was based on the AUGMENT trial, which is a large randomized phase three trial that, that randomized patients to receive either the R-squared regimen versus um, rituximab plus placebo. So eligible patients could not be refractory with rituximab in order to enter on this trial. They had all had to have at least one or more uh, chemotherapy um, regimens. So patients um, were entered onto this trial, and I think some of the details of these different R-squared regimens are important because, as you'll see, pretty much whether you use it frontline or whether you use it second line, these regimens vary from, um, from trial to trial. But in this case, um, the outline of the, of the Regimen is listed here. Lenalidomide was given 20 milligrams on days 1 through 21 of a 28-day cycle along with rituximab. These are the progression-free survival curves. You can see clearly the R-square was a winner in terms of progression-free survival with a pro um, median progression-free survival of almost 40 months compared to the 14 months was seen with, with rituximab. So clearly an improvement in progression-free survival. These are some of the key secondary endpoints, which were looking at overall response uh, and complete remission rate. And again, R squared was superior to single agent rituximab in terms of complete remission and overall response rate. But what was not different was the um, was overall survival, and this is the overall survival curve. While there's certainly a trend towards improvement in R squared, um, at this point, the, um, the uh, confidence intervals included one in terms of the hazard ratio, and there was not a statistically significant difference seen. There are differences in adverse events, and so um, this is an important consideration when, depending on what your patient, uh, some of the other comorbidities and how old your patient is and thinking about these different regimens. On the right, we see the treatment at emergent adverse events for rituximab versus the R-squared regimen. The darker colors represent the, the grade three and four events versus the lighter color, which is grade one or two. And you can see right off the top here that there's an increased risk of infections in patients treated with R-squared. There's an increased risk of neutropenia in pa um, patients treated with R-squared as well as some of these cutaneous um, reactions. And then some of the ad adverse events is, are listed here as well, but they taper off. So a very important consideration to, um, when, when considering the, 
the, uh, the R squared regimen in these patients with, um, with uh, follicular lymphoma. And I think it has meaningful um, differences in terms of progression free survival, but also, of course, adverse events are more common in, in the R squared regimen and most commonly the, the neutropenia infectious complications. But this study did lead to the FDA approval in May of this year for this, for this regimen for patients relapsed refractory um, follicular lymphoma. Now, R squared has also been, ex, um, been studied in the upfront uh, line in patients with follicular lymphoma. This is one of the earlier studies. This is uh, Eva Kimby's publication. In, um, and again, the details here are a little bit different in terms of the R squared regimen. This is um, R squared at a lower dose of 15 milligrams um, per day, and it's, and it's given with, for a shorter duration of time uh, than what we'll see in the, in the relevance trial that's coming up here. But R squared in this, in the frontline setting, also beat uh, rituximab as a single agent. Now, the relevance trial was a very large international phase three trial comparing R, the R squared regimen versus chemoimmunotherapy um, in previously untreated patients with advanced follicular lymphoma. And the details are listed here, and they're a little bit complicated, but if you think about it in different periods of time, patients who were randomized receive either R squared or R chemo um, as the inductions. And in R chemo, the patients also went on to receive basically two years of rituximab maintenance. Now, in the R squared arm, after this initial six months of induction, these patients could continue on R squared. If they achieved a complete remission, then the dose was reduced um, to 10, 10 milligrams a day of, of lenalidomide. Um, but if they um, were just achieved a partial remission, then they were continued on the standard dose of 20. And finally, once the R squared was um, completed, they finished out with uh, single agent rituximab and a maintenance uh, type approach. This lists the responses for the patients. So the co-primary endpoint was complete remission or CRU at 120 weeks. And there was a, perhaps a, uh, a slight numerical superiority on, on, to the R chemo, but no um, statistically significant uh, difference. That was true with some of these other endpoints in complete remission and overall response rate. This is the progression-free and overall survival curves, the progression-free on the left and the overall survival on the right. And as you can see, there's absolutely no difference in terms of progression-free overall survival between these two regimens. And so while this trial was, a, was designed as a superiority trial and clearly did not meet the, that, uh, that endpoint, uh, many interpret this to say that this is a reasonable option for patients with um, previously untreated follicular lymphoma um, in, if, the, if your patient wants to avoid um, a chemotherapy regimen. Now, chemotherapy-free does not mean free of adverse events, and of course, we went through some of the adverse events uh, with the uh, augment trial, but you're seeing cutaneous reactions. You can see a tumor flare and, and diarrhea, whereas with the R chemotherapy, you're much more likely to see neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, need for growth factor use, and of course, nausea, vomiting, neuropathy, and alopecia, depending on the specific R chemotherapy regimen you use. Now, some practical tips about lenalidomide. I mean, I think some of these are obvious for anybody who's ever used uh, an IMID, such as the exclusion for pregnancy. And I think less um, recognized but important is that there's hematologic toxicities, and you have to monitor a patient's count. And finally, venous and arterial thrombal embolism is an associated side effect, and so um, it's generally recommended that patient receive some form of antithrombotic pro prophylaxis. I'm going to kind of continue on and uh, talk a little bit now about uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, as, um, as we've come to know that there are different isoforms of the PI3 kinase, they include alpha, beta, uh, gamma, and delta. Um, Idelalisib was the first PI3 kinase inhibitor improved, and it was a delta isoform specific. The delta isoform is, is, is a particular interest in the hematologic malignancies because its expression is generally limited to um, cells of hematopoietic origin. And so that was the original hypothesis between idelalisib that it, by targeting the delta isoform and not um, hitting the other isoforms, and we could perhaps avoid some of the toxicities that are associated with this, such as glucose metabolism that occurs when you inhibit the alpha isoform. Duvalisib is a inhibitor of both the delta and the gamma isoforms. The gamma isoform in the inhibition might be important because um, by inhibiting the microenvironment, you're inhibiting some of these cell-cell interactions and survival signals that may support the malignant clone. Both duvalisib and idelalisib or oral agents, whereas copanlisib, the third of this is a IV drug. It is um, both a delta inhibitor as well as an inhibitor of the alpha isoform. 
maybe less important in some malignancies than other, but we know, for instance, in mantle cell lymphoma that the alpha isoform is upregulated, and so there might be diseases in which um, it's important to inhibit both alpha and delta isoform as well. And finally, we're going to touch upon umbrilisib, which is a pure delta inhibitor. It's not FDA approved yet, but, um, but it's an exciting new um, therapy that's making its way through the, the regulatory pathway. Now, as I mentioned, idelisib was the first PI3 kinase in inhibitor approved, and this is based on um, several um, trials. One was a combination with um, rituximab versus rituximab alone in patients with relapsed chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and this is the progression-free survival curve from that. The other was in follicular lymphoma, there was a single arm uh, study where um, idelisib was given as a single agent, and you can, this is the waterfall plot from that trial showing you the the percentage tumor reduction in the patient's mass is based on their different histology. But as I mentioned recently, there's been two new gen next generation PI3 kinase inhibitors that are approved. They are duvalisib and copanlisib. Cop duvalisib is approved for both CLL and SLL as well as follicular lymphoma, whereas copanlisib is approved for follicular lymphoma alone. Duvalisib was initially studied in a broad phase one trial across the hematologic malignancies. Um, and from that phase one trial, we learned a couple things. One is that the maximum tolerated dose was 75 milligrams twice a day. But it didn't look like, at least in indolent lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, that we, um, we really needed to treat patients with that high a dose. In fact, there was really equal efficacy, or maybe um, in, in a lower dose of 25 milligrams twice a day. And given the some of the the uh, cumulative toxicity that can be seen with prolonged PI3 kinase in inhibition um, using a lesser dose that was um, um, uh, equally as active is, is attractive. This is the progression-free survival curves looking at these two different cohorts and the doses, and as you can see, the 25 milligram um, dose did decently equally as well or, or better than the patients treated with 75. And so that led to the Dynamo trial. The Dynamo trial was a phase two monotherapy trial of duvalisib in patients with, um, with um, double refractory follicular lymphoma, actually all forms of indolent uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but double refractory mean um, just like was done in the idelisib study, patients had to be refractory to both um, rituximab as well as um, chemotherapy or uh, radioimmunotherapy. The median number of patients on this study was three, Patients want to receive duvalisib 25 milligrams um, twice a day. Now, the primary endpoint for this was overall response rate by an independent response committee, but there are key secondary endpoints, including safety, duration response, progression-free, and overall survival. Um, this is the waterfall plot um, from, from the Dynamo trial. In this double refractory patient population, um, the darker color is the patients with the flick lymphoma, um, and we're also seeing uh, responses in patients with marginal zone as well as small lymphocytic lymphoma. The median duration of response was 10 months, and median progression-free survival was uh, nine and a half months. This leads us to, um, to the Kronos-1 study. This is a study with copanlisib in patients with relapsed and refractory indolent lymphoma. Um, this time, the design's a little bit different. Patients eligible for this trial um, were, had indolent lymphoma, but they ha only had to have two lines of prior therapy, meaning they didn't have to be double refractory. They just had to have two, two prior therapies in this study receiving an overall response rate of, uh, of 59% um, uh, in, uh, in this entire patient population. This was confirmed in a subsequent analysis where the median duration response was found to be greater than a year and median progression-free survival was, was 11.3 months. These are the progression-free survival and overall survival curves from, um, from Kronos 1. On the left, we're seeing the progression-free survival and again demonstrating a median progression-free survival of just uh, just superior to 11 months, and median overall survival has not been met uh, at this analysis. There are many PI3 kinase inhibitors that are being developed, but the one that's most closest to um, finishing its regulatory pathway is umbrilisib. In a phase one study um, with umbrilisib, we saw um, substantial um, response rates as well as um, tumor reduction in CLL and follicular lymphoma. Um, as well as um, some of the other histologies that are listed here. And in fact, in the flick lymphoma, there's a little bit more than half of the patients responded um, in patients with CLL who had high-risk features. Um, there was a 75% response rate versus 85% in the overall population. The thing I think that's encouraging about this one, and we'll have to wait to see how the final data um, pans out, is that it has a different adverse event profile 
um, less of the adverse events such as liver function abnormalities um, that we see with some of the first and second generation molecules. And in and, and talking about and thinking about some of these adverse events, there is a, an important safety experience that's it's important to keep in mind with PI3 kinase inhibitors. Of course, you may recall with idelalisib, there's the, some of the hepatotoxicity that's seen, as well as some of the uh, GI events such as uh, diarrhea and colitis, as well as pneumonitis that can be seen very rarely. Less of a occurrence with dubalisib, but it still occurs. Now, the good thing is that for most of these patients, especially those patients who have liver function abnormalities, if you hold the drug and wait for the abnormalities to resolve, you can restart patients on these uh, molecules. Now, again, these are the two oral agents. Copenlisib is an IV drug, and it shares some of the toxicities such as infectious complications that we see with the other PI3 kinase inhibitors, although there seems to be less of the liver function abnormalities and colitis or diarrhea that's seen with co copenlisib. But it has a couple of unique adverse events. They are hyperglycemia, generally transient around the infusion, as well as hypertension that can occur with this. And so as I mentioned earlier, there are strategies to manage these adverse events, and they generally involve dose interruption or in, in dose reduction depending on the adverse event. I think one thing that we've learned from Dubalisib, um, this has been recently presented, is that physicians shouldn't be afraid of holding the medication until the adverse event um, resolves or, or dose reducing. When we analyzed these results with Dubalisib, we found that the outcomes were exactly the same as those for patients that had un uninterrupted uh, treatment with a, with a PI3 kinase inhibitor. So um, I think in, just in summary, there are, um, there are a number of options beyond uh, immunochemotherapy for, the, for patients with flick lymphoma. Um, in the relapse setting, they include, uh, they include the R-squared regimen as well as the PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, and this greater number of options allows for um, greater flexibility in our, in our sequencing of treatments for follicular lymphoma. As, as we all know that these patients, um, thankfully many patients have a long natural history, but they're also um, in long survival, but that also means they have to be managed for a long time. And so, so figuring out what is the most optimal sequencing of, uh, of therapies for patients um, is important. Some of these, some of these uh, adverse events, some of these toxicities can be cumulative. Um, each of the agents have, have different safety profiles. So in trying to match your patient with, uh, with an individual therapy is important based on some of their comorbidities. Next up is Ryan Jacobs, who's going to um, talk about personalized care and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Ryan. All right, thanks everybody. We'll get going. There's a lot to talk about with CLL. Here we will start with a case just like uh, the follicular lymphoma discussion. So we've got Penny, a uh, 58-year-old female. Uh, she presents with um, B symptoms, um, and is, she has bulky nodes in both the neck and axilla. So you, you've got two indications for treatment right there, the B symptoms and uh, the the, the bulky nose, particularly if they're, if they're painful. Uh, don't have a slide on this just for the sake of time, but we're still not treating uh, asymptomatic CLL patients. Uh, we're waiting for indications for treatment, just like with follicular lymphoma. So she gets worked up, uh, and uh, while anemic, not really significantly so, hemoglobin's 11, has, has still a decent amount of platelets, uh, with 110,000, white count is... 94,000, so moderately high. Flow confirms CLL, and she gets a marrow. It's not always necessary to get a marrow in CLL these days. You can make the diagnosis on flow as, um, as she got here, but there's still some utility in certain circumstances. Marrow shows that her, uh, her uh, disease has taken up about 70% of the marrow space. Uh, she gets prognostic workup done correctly with uh, FISH that shows 13Q deletion, and she has IGHV uh, unmutated. So uh, this is a younger patient, but she is IGHV unmutated. Traditionally, uh, probably would have gotten FCR. Uh, in 2019, we now have additional options in the frontline setting beyond just chemoimmunotherapy, uh, which is good for a patient like uh, like Penny, um, who historically we know IGHV unmutated patients uh, have not been doing so well in terms of long-term progression-free survival uh, with our traditional chemoimmunotherapy options. Uh, 
So for the, uh, for the sake of discussion in terms of relating this patient to um, a, a cooperative group uh, alliance trial that we're going to discuss later, uh, we'll say Penny gets uh, a brutinib at 420 milligrams daily. Uh, it would be uh, very appropriate and perhaps given the young age, maybe in my clinic I would actually even lean towards um, the, the option of venetoclax and obinutuzumab in this patient though. So Penny starts on a brutinib, responds well, tolerates the drug for, for a year. Um, Long-term follow-up on a brutinib patients is now out to seven years uh, if for the early phase clinical studies and over 70 percent of patients are still free of progression, so that's pretty remarkable. But unfortunately, sometimes uh, patients have uh, toxicity on a brutinib. Again, it's given uh, orally, daily, continuously. So um, toxicities do occur. Overall, well-tolerated drug, as I'll show you later, but um, atrial fibrillation is, is a toxicity that certainly gets uh, a lot of uh, notoriety in terms of a brutinib treatment. So say uh, this patient gets atrial fibrillation. Uh, we now luckily have an alternative BTK inhibitor option in acalabrutinib, which uh, while we're still awaiting on head-to-head -head data that I'll show you later, um, uh, there is some hope that this agent uh, does not have the same cardiac uh, comorbidities that, that abrutinib does. So for a patient that's responding to BTK inhibition that um, has to come off treatment due to toxicity, we now have an off-label option with a acalabrutinib, uh, although it's not currently FDA approved for the treatment of CLL. It is uh, approved for mantle cell lymphoma, uh, but it does get a lot of off-label use, and CLL has breakthrough designation by the FDA uh, recently for, for the treatment of uh, CLL, and as I'll show you later, it's on the NCCN guidelines. Um, would not think about a acalabrutinib in a patient, though, that progressed uh, say Penny progresses on, uh, on abrutinib after responding for quite some time. Uh, the majority of patients that do progress on abrutinib, 80 plus percent are going to have mutations at the C481S binding site where abrutinib and acalabrutinib both hit. So you would not try acalabrutinib in a patient that has, uh, has progressed on abrutinib. And you think about an alternative option like venetoclax that we'll discuss. So we'll change the scenario a little bit. Uh, we'll make Penny a little older, a little more comorbid, 72-year-old uh, with, uh, with COPD now. Same prognostic workup. Uh, you, you, you do want to send the fish an IGHV mutational analysis, also TP53 mutational analysis on all your patients prior to treatment. Um, so she is unmutated at the IGHV gene uh, still in this circumstance. And uh, again, both the brutinib uh, and venetoclax are category one options that I'll show you later in the frontline setting, and both would be appropriate. So uh, I know Ian covered some of the remarkable um, improvements we've had in the therapy across the lymphoma spectrum, and specifically to CLL, these uh, small molecule inhibitors have all become available since 2014, and how different the CLL treatment landscape is for patients uh, now in 2019 than where we were at in 2014. We're gonna focus on the BTK and BCL2 inhibitors today. Uh, Ian did a great job of talking about the PI3 kinase inhibitors already. Um, so we'll start with BTK, because they were around first, or specifically abrutinib in terms of uh, approval for treatment of, of CLL all the way back in what seems like a long time ago, but actually not that long ago, just in 2014. So this slide reads uh, better from, from right to left. Uh, the original Resonate study was what led to Abrutinib's approval in 2014 in the relapse setting. Um, it was a big breakthrough for CLL patients. Relapse CLL patients were maybe getting a year or two of benefit with treatment uh, with chemoimmunotherapy. And uh, we now know that uh, abrutinib's benefit in the relapse setting is, uh, you know, between four and five years um, uh, median. So abrutinib quickly became the uh, treatment of choice in the relapse setting based on the Resonate study. We did have some uh, extended approval for the high-risk 17P patients in the frontline setting all the way back in 2014, but uh, that was based on how the 17P patients were actually doing in the re uh, relapse setting on the Resonate study. Uh, 
um, 17 P patients, even with our strongest chemoimmunotherapy of FCR, maybe get a year or so of PFS. So the FDA saw that the 17 P deleted patients were doing uh, significantly better even in the relapse setting. So they extended the approval in the frontline setting. But in 2016, we had uh, extended approval of abrutinib uh, based on the Resonate 2 study uh, that compared abrutinib to chlorambicil in older comorbid patients. Um, so now, uh, starting in 2016, all uh, CLL patients, either be it frontline or relapse, could get abrutinib. A lot of uh, oncologists did not like the comparator arm of chlorambicil in the Resonate 2 study. Uh, thankfully, now in 20, um, towards the 20, uh, end of 2018 and in 2019, we've had the publication of two cooperative group studies that has compared uh, abrutinib to our most common chemoimmunotherapy treatments that we were using in the frontline setting. Uh, so we don't have to complain about uh, the chlorambicil comparator anymore. So the more notable of these two cooperative group studies, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover them both. This was a plenary presentation at ASH last year, the Alliance study uh, uh, released in the New England Journal after the, after the presentation at ASH. And it looked at patients over the age of 65. So these are the patients that you wouldn't be thinking about giving FCR to because of their, um, their older age. We know FCR is more, um, has more, uh, more morbidity in, in patients over the age of 65. So the control arm was benamustine and rituximab, and the two investigational arms was abrutinib single agent and uh, abrutinib with rituximab, given in a similar way as rituximab on the bendamustine arm. So a three-arm study, deletion 17P patients were included, but they were a small fraction. Here are the PFS curves. So there was a statistically significant uh, benefit in progression-free survival when compared to bendamustine and rituximab in both the abrutinib arms versus bendamustine rituximab. You, you can see here, though, that there is no difference between the abrutinib and rituximab arm as there, um, when compared to the single agent abrutinib arm. And this is now the third study that we've had that has looked at uh, abrutinib with rituximab versus abrutinib alone and shown no um, significant difference between the two. So. I think one of the big uh, positive elements of treatment with abrutinib is uh, its simplicity and its ease of starting uh, treatment with, uh, you know, at my institution, I'm, I'm just sending an electronic script to my specialty pharmacy and the drug shows up on the patient's doorstep two or three days later. They don't have to worry about the infusion center, et cetera. So I'm not um, jumping at adding a monoclonal to abrutinib uh, be it rituximab or obinutuzumab, uh, unless uh, I ultimately see compelling evidence saying it, 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 it improves outcomes. Notably, there is no difference in overall survival in this study, but, uh, but that, that can be hard to show in chronic, uh, chronic cancers. Here is the ECOG study, very recently published in the New England Journal. Uh, this was a late-breaking presentation at ASH and it compared the FCR to uh, abrutinib with uh, rituximab, and it was looking mainly in younger patients, uh, but it did take patients up to the age of 70, and deletion 17P uh, were excluded. So uh, at three years, there was a statistically significant progression-free uh, survival benefit, and while that was surprise, maybe surprising to some, uh, what, what was actually more notable is at that same point in follow-up, there was a statistically significant benefit in overall survival. And when they, uh, when they looked at the, you know, the causes of death, it was, you know, it's not surprising to anybody that's treated with FCR before, but some early deaths due to infection. So uh, clearly benefits the unmutated group in terms of progression-free survival, notably uh, no statistical significant benefit in the IGHV mutated uh, patients. So there, there are still uh, some that are holding on to FCR's use in the young uh, IGHV mutated patient. Uh, notably, you'd want one without high risk findings on fish as well. Uh, that represents about a total of 12% of the CLL population, so you're not talking about a large group of patients. Uh, the biggest argument for that was the ability to give a time-defined uh, time treatment as opposed to indefinite therapy. Um, 
I would argue now that we have an option of time-dependent, uh, time-defined therapy with, with venetoclax that, that the, the one big plus with FCR has now been um, kind of negated. So, um, but, the, but FCR, it's, it's still um, certainly an option to discuss with, uh, with patients. In terms of toxicities, this is a, a long-term follow-up uh, by Susan O'Brien looking at uh, high-grade um, high toxicities. Um, and you can see hypertension here. That appears to be the only cumulative toxicity that abrutinib has over time. Um, so there, there hasn't been any other, uh, with long-term follow-up, emerging toxicities uh, that have popped up. We mentioned the atrial fibrillation. Uh, overall, when you look at the trials, between 5 and 10 percent. Um, the low-grade toxicities that get noted by patients are usually diarrhea, bruising. Uh, those usually do not lead to uh, discontinuation. Uh, rash is another notable one. So I'd mentioned a calibrutinib. This is a, um, you know, when you look at this kinome here, uh, felt to be a more specific uh, BTK inhibitor, uh, has less off-target BTK effects, and so the, the hypothesis is then it will ultimately prove to have less toxicities. Uh, really exciting initial phase 1 uh, B slash 2 study presented at ASH about three years ago now and published in the New England Journal. Nice flat PFS curve uh, in a relapsed refractory population, uh, but ultimately still not approved by the FDA for treatment in CLL. We have it available um, now for a while uh, because of its approval in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, and a lot of its use is actually uh, off-label in CLL, mainly in patients uh, that have, as I mentioned earlier, had to come off of a brutinib because of a toxicity issue. And studies uh, have shown notably a, a prospective study by Farouk Awan that 70 plus percent of patients that have had to come off of a brutinib because of a toxicity can be switched to a calibrutinib and continue on treatment without having that uh, toxicity that they had on a brutinib uh, recur. So, um, it has made it onto the NCCN guidelines in the relapse setting based on uh, some recently presented uh, ASCEND data at, um, uh, at EHA uh, that looked at a calibrutinib versus a kind of dealer's choice of um, uh, idilisib and rituximab or benamustine rituximab in the relapse setting. And you can see the difference in the PFS curves uh, here at 12 months. Uh, what the studies that we're waiting on um, uh, that are pending are listed here. I would note the, the, the top two are looking at PFS um, differences. I, I don't think there will be a big surprise uh, with the Elevate CLL trial showing PFS benefit when compared to obinutuzumab. Um, it'll be interesting to look at if obinutuzumab seems to be additive to a calibrutinib, though. Uh, what, uh, what I'm interested in seeing and is supposed to maybe be reported early next year is this bottom study that's a non-inferiority study between a brutinib and a calibrutinib. Um, and we should finally get some head-to-head -head data in terms of what, what are the differences between these two and, and, and particularly looking at the toxicity. Because because they hit the same you know, um, point on the BTK at the C481S binding site, I, I, I'm not confident that, one, that a calibrutinib will ultimately show superiority in terms of, of, of PFS, but I, I, won't, I won't be surprised if there are uh, differences between the two in terms of toxicity. So what are the toxicities of a calibrutinib? Again, you look at the grade 3 to 4 column, overall a well-tolerated drug, uh, but like a brutinib, you know, uh, discontinuations are, are less than 10% when you look at the study in terms of uh, discontinuing due to adverse events. Some notable toxicities that appear to be unique, um, you know, the diarrhea is still there uh, enlisted uh, up at the top, but headache uh, can happen. That seems to be unique to a calibrutinib. It's, it's restricted to earlier in treatment. It's usually low grade. Often a uh, patient won't mention it unless you ask them and usually don't even need Tylenol, but Tylenol seems to be effective enough if they do need it. I've not had it um, lead to a discontinuation in a, in a patient. And then edema is another one that can, um, while also low grade, be something that's maybe a bit different between 
uh, a calibrutinib and a brutinib. And we'll conclude here by discussing venetoclax. So uh, while we've been talking about kinase inhibitors mostly with um, PI3 kinase inhibitors, BTK inhibitor, uh, Venetoclax is, is not a kinase inhibitor, but it does fall in this sm um, small molecule inhibitor category, these newer oral targeted treatments that, we, that have, have been such a, a great breakthrough for our patients. Uh, so the BCL2 protein uh, has been found to be overexpressed in CLL, uh, but uh, also, uh, as opposed to BTK, which is more unique to B-cell malignancies, uh, BCL2 is, is not uh, restricted to, um, to, to CLL. Uh, you might be aware of the drug's approval and the treatment of uh, AML, uh, and there's even breast cancer trials going on, so it, it will likely um, be something that shows up on the solid malignancy side. Uh, so what, when, when BCL2 is overexpressed, it binds up proapoptotic proteins uh, released by the, uh, by the cell in response to DNA damage. So uh, then, therefore, the cell's more resistant to, to apoptosis. So you throw in venetoclax, and rather abruptly, those preapoptotic proteins are released and lead to mitochondrial uh, membrane permeabilization. Caspases get released into the cell, and the cell apoptosis through uh, breaking up its outer cell membrane. So its abrupt uh, activity is in contrast to BTK inhibition, which uh, can take a median of four months before you see you know, kind of the, what you would mark as an official response in terms of 50% um, uh, uh, disease burden reduction um, and leads to the t tumor lysis syndrome issues that, that, that I'll discuss uh, later in the deck. So here, uh, we're not going to discuss the uh, initial trial that led to the drug's approval, uh, which was single agent use back in 2016 for high-risk CLL patients defined as having a, a, a 17P deletion on fish. What was really exciting was in 2018, uh, the Murano study uh, led to the um, approval in the relapse setting uh, where venetoclax is given with rituximab, and it was compared to benamustine and rituximab uh, in a head-to-head -head study. Um, and the, it, really exciting part about this approval was that uh, venetoclax was given over a two-year period after six months of rituximab and stopped. So this is the first example of uh, one of these small molecule inhibitors uh, with a defined treatment timeline because uh, we were all uh, happy that we had these new treatments and that they worked well for so long, but we were concerned about the cost over time. So uh, you can see, and this is with now extended follow-up that we got uh, last ASH, uh, so now three years of follow-up, the big difference in PFS curves, and at the three-year follow-up uh, that's now been published as well, there was an overall survival uh, improvement that, that was seen. So we all want to know how these patients are doing once you stop. Uh, didn't have a whole lot of data at the initial publication. Uh, it was only two years of follow-up. Uh, with last year's ASH, we got an additional year. Uh, we're about to get another year's worth of, of data at this year's ASH. Um, so the short of it is the patients that obtain minimal residual disease negativity are doing quite well and not relapsing after they stop. And even the patients, and, and that's in this black line at the top here, that get near uh, uh, MRD negative, so 10 to the minus 2 uh, or, or worse, uh, are, are, seem to be doing uh, quite well. And for, for those of you that um, aren't necessarily familiar with MRD testing, not part of standard clinical practice guidelines yet in CLL, um, probably still a send out at most institutions. Uh, it's, it can be done with flow cytometry or PCR, and it's where we're looking at one cancer cell uh, in 10,000. Um, the, uh, the rate of MRD negativity in the relapse setting with venetoclax was um, around uh, 57%, uh, which is co comparable to what FCR was doing uh, in the frontline setting. So you have this chemo-free option that in the relapse setting was getting a depth of response equal to that of our strongest chemoimmunotherapy combination, um, and it was really exciting. But uh, more recently, 
uh, we now have this combination of obinutuzumab with venetoclax, and venetoclax given over a year uh, and just approved uh, in May of this year for frontline treatment of CLL. So for, for everyone that was really concerned about the implications of all these patients on indefinite uh, abrutinib, we now have a time-defined treatment option um, recently published in the New England Journal and leading to, um, to approval. This was a study that, w because of its comparative of obinutuzumab and chlorambucil, uh, was looking at older patients that you wouldn't give chemo immunotherapy to, but the, um, because of the impressive PFS curve, the FDA approved it for, um, for all frontline CLL patients. And here is the MRD negativity rates that was exciting, 76% in the peripheral blood, so better than we been, had been able to do with, with chemo immunotherapy. Um, when you looked in the marrow, while numerically less, the, uh, you know, they found really with venetoclax-based treatments that the peripheral blood MR MRD testing correlates to about 92% degree with the, with the bone marrow. So you can, you can you know, in, in clinical practice, save a, an invasive procedure and just test the peripheral blood and be pretty confident in it. In terms of toxicities of venetoclax, the TLS on the right is uh, what most think about, but since the five-week dose ramp-up and appropriate risk stratification has been in place, uh, there's actually been no cases of clinically a significant tumor lysis syndrome on any prospective venetoclax trials. So it's quite safe if you follow the, the package insert instructions in terms of the ramp-up. What you actually will deal with uh, is, is neutropenia. So in the Murano study specifically, three quarters of patients ended up having to hold treatment at some point, and the large majority of those patients were um, having to hold because of uh, neutropenia. Uh, but diarrhea can be something you deal with. Um, uh, joint pain's another one. And because of the neutropenia issues, you want to watch out for infection. Uh, just like with a brutinib, with a calibrutinib, you can use growth factor and not interrupt treatment. And, and I, I often do that. Um, it's a bit different from IV chemotherapy in that way. So here's the uh, NCCN uh, updates, and it's basically the, the BTK versus BCL2 options in the, both the front line and the relapse setting as being the category one indications. Everything else has been moved to uh, category two uh, or, or, or less. And, and as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we don't really have data to support one option over the, over the other in terms of uh, BTK versus BCL2 inhibition. So in conclusion, um, it's, it's, it's really a um, great time for, for our CLL patients in terms of treatment options. Uh, BCL2 uh, is, is, is an option that we're excited about in terms of time-defined treatment. Uh, but when it, it may take a long time, but it's, gonna, it, it's possible that perhaps in terms of long-term outcomes, uh, a disease-modulating agent uh, targeting BTK given indefinitely ends up being ultimately the best approach. We, we just don't know at this point. And there's advantages and disadvantages uh, to both. Um, we'll have some uh, exciting data on looking at these two agents uh, given together at, at ASH this, this year, that, um, a trial that both uh, Ian and myself uh, participated in. Next up is uh, Dr. Gia Ruan, who's going to talk about Mantle cell lymphoma and ins insights on treatment choices. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm pleased to be here today and discuss about uh, treatment for mantle cell lymphoma with a focus on uh, management of relapse refractory disease. Okay, so we're going to start with a, a case study as well. Um, here we have uh, Greg, a 63-year-old uh, man who presented with. Uh, painless uh, left cervical mass, which only presented for about two, three months. Uh, duration on physical exam, they were palpable left cervical mass and scattered other lymphadenopathy uh, fairly diffusely. Uh, laboratory study basically was somewhat unremarkable with the exception of elevated LDH. Um, and PET scan basically showed quite diffuse hypermetabolism above and below diaphragm. Um, there were also some hypermetabolic splenomegaly. The pathology came back, uh, which confirmed that, you know, he has 
uh, MCL, which uh, was SOX11 positive. Uh, the key 67 was about 10%. However, there were focal higher proliferation index at 40%. The FISH study came back, again, confirmed MCL diagnosis because translocation 1114. Interestingly, there were three copies of TP53 mutation, which sometimes comes with higher risk uh, for disease progression and uh, treatment resistance. Bone marrow biopsy showed involvement as well. Greg was uh, quite anxious, you know, certainly um, other than lymphadenopathy, um, you know, he wasn't having too much of constitutional symptom. However, he was traveling back and forth and, uh, you know, not feeling um, settled without treatment. So in discussion with his primary care physician, um, he opted for induction chemotherapy uh, in the outpatient setting. Uh, so he received six cycles of bendamustine plus rituximab, which he tolerated very well and achieved a very good uh, partial remission. Subsequent to that, because of business, he traveled overseas and failed to show up for follow-ups. Uh, less than a year later, uh, came back with a very uh, symptomatic enlarging left side cervical lymphadenopathy again. Um, a very promptly lymph node biopsy was obtained. This time there were complete effacement and appeared to have increased size uh, of the B cell here, so small to medium size. Uh, they were SOX11 positive and TP53 quite positive. And key 67 was increased to 50%. So the morphology here uh, was more consistent with pleomorphic, if it's not um, blastoid mental cell lymphoma, more aggressive than prior. Um, PET CT scan showed diffuse hypermetabolism again. Um, and this time, patient was quite symptomatic. Um, so here we have the question of further management in a patient with relapsed uh, mental cell lymphoma. Uh, very short uh, treatment to response duration, so early relapse, um, uh, not even a year. Uh, what do we, um, you know, contemplate in terms of providing uh, treatment? Do we rechallenge with chemoimmunotherapy, um, or do we consider um, more for novel agent class? So, so there are data which suggest that early relapse disease tend to have more aggressive uh, clinical behavior and resistant to treatment, particularly chemotherapy. So again, you know, chemoimmunotherapy is available, but it's unlikely to work very well. So here um, are possible or advocating uh, options uh, would be novel agent based. As you can see here, we listed the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib or aclabrutinib. Both were uh, approved for relapse or refractory mental cell lymphoma. You also have immunomodulatory agent lenalidomide and BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax each has single agent activity and are being actively uh, explored in combination um, in clinical trial settings. So for this particular patient, Greg, uh, we discussed, you know, um, options of novel treatment. We also um, advocate for clinical trial participation. So eventually he went on a clinical trial with BTK backbone uh, with ibrutinib plus CDK4-6 inhibitor, and he's been doing very well on the treatment. So this leads us to, uh, you know, a, a, a brief summary of, of mental cell lymphoma. Um, as you know, you know, similar to follicular lymphoma and CLL, uh, they are generally incurable, but differently, they tend to be more aggressive. And um, patients generally present with nodal disease. Uh, they could have constitutional symptoms. They could also have quite extensive extranodal uh, presentations in blood, bone marrow, and gastrointestinal tract. And interestingly, about 30%, which is a small proportion of mental cell lymphoma, patients could present initially with non-nodal MCL, which are characterized by uh, lymphocyto leukocytosis, uh, splenomegaly, but very uh, limited uh, lymphadenopathy. They tend to be associated with memory B cell, 
um, features and SOX11 were negative, um, IGVH could be mutated. So that's in contrast with our case, you know, the patient actually presents with a fairly classic nodal MCL. They were SOX11 positive and IGVH tend to be unmutated. Um, mental cell lymphoma is a good casing study for multi-step um, pathogenesis um, by uh, compound uh, mutations. It started with a prim primary driver event, which is translocation um, 1114 and cycling D1 overexpression. That basically leads to expansion of the B cell compartment and, and genomic instability. With that, uh, you have additional secondary or tertiary driver events. Um, which could be, you know, DNA damage repair pathway uh, mutations or loss of tumor suppressor genes such as RB1 or P53, et cetera, that they start to accumulate complex karyotype and also picking up on proliferation uh, index or a rate uh, which correlating with disease development from indolent to more uh, fast-growing classic mental cell lymphoma, eventually blastoid or pleomorphic uh, mental cell lymphoma. So to date, the backbone treatment for mental cell lymphoma initially continued to be uh, chemoimmunotherapy that's based on two decades of uh, data coming from phase two primarily, some phase three data, as well as population studies. Uh, for lack of other discriminators, because of the side effects of cytotoxic treatment, um, uh, comorbidities such as age um, and other factors uh, do differentiate when you discuss uh, initial treatment options. For patients who are candidate for high-intensity uh, treatment um, uh, in, uh, regimens that's containing hydrocytarabine, um, such as um, RD hacks or the MCL network uh, alternating RCHOP or DHAP, uh, Nordic regimens or hypercivad, those are commonly uh, utilized backbone with or without autologous stem cell transplant. Um, for patients with uh, comorbidity issues, uh, median uh, intensity regimen that, that are administered in outpatient settings such as BR, bendamustine rituximab, VR cap, and, and RCHOP with rituximab uh, maintenance are generally favored. Uh, the higher intensity cytarabine-based regimen generally give a longer progression-free survival in the range of eight to nine years with patients um, surviving longer than a decade. Um, with the more intermediate strength um, outpatient-based regimen, one expects three to four years of progression-free survival, um, and that data is continued to uh, evolve. So um, with the advancement of novel agents, you know, what difference it really makes is in the relapse setting, uh, second-line settings, um, where um, uh, you know, practitioners based on the clinical trial data begin to uh, apply or prioritize novel agents. In this particular case, because of the short response to prior chemoimmunotherapy, again, um, targeted biological agents uh, would be uh, prioritized here. And we uh, discussed the list of them that include aclabrutinib, ibrutinib plus rituximab, the R-square regimen, lenalidomide, rituximab, venetoclax. Those are all viable and effective options. So let's um, move on to review data with BTK inhibitors, uh, including the ibrutinib and aclabrutinib. Um, so, um, as was uh, well summarized in the earlier talk, um, I'll be very brief here. For mental cell lymphoma, ibrutinib was approved uh, for relapse disease in 2013, and this was followed by aclabrutinib, which was approved in 2017 um, as single agent uh, for second line and above uh, treatment. Uh, we also have a new agent, Zambrut. Um, then new brutinib, uh, which are um, being designated for breakthrough um, therapy, and, and, and phase three trials for that particular compound is ongoing. In the pivotal study with ibrutinib, which included uh, over 100 patients, 
uh, patients were given five, uh, 60 milligram daily uh, ibrutinib, and um, the uh, median prior therapy was three in, in this particular patient population. The uh, adverse events uh, commonly encountered include diarrhea, fatigue, and nausea, and very mild uh, cytopenias. The overall response rate was 60 seven percent was 23 uh, CR rate and the duration of response was over 17 months and it's interesting to note that those patients who had achieved CR tend to have much longer duration of response in comparison to those who had uh, suboptimal response. <coughs> Because of that, um, strategies are being explored uh, to uh, use ibrutinib combination in order to achieve better response, particularly CR. Those uh, examples including addition of rituximab to ibrutinib, uh, the combination of R-square, which is rituximab lenalidomide, plus ibrutinib, um, as well as incorporating onto a chemoimmunotherapy backbone such as BR. And um, it's interesting uh, to review how the combination uh, can potentially uh, achieve. So here we have the, uh, the, the, the um, outcome of the AIM study, which uh, essentially evaluated the combination of BCL2 inhibitor addition venetoclax to ibrutinib in patients with uh, relapse refractory mental cell lymphoma. In this uh, small data sets, which included 24 patients, uh, one of them actually had treatment naive disease, and majority of the patient had high risk disease, including TP53 mutation and complex cytogenetic. Um, the CR was achieved in 42% patient, and, um, and um, you know, if you evaluate with PET, that uh, CR actually was higher at 62%, uh, which was significantly improved from uh, historical control with single agent, and particularly in those high-risk MCL population. And moreover, I think this study also showcased the MRD assessment, uh, which essentially delineate the depth of the response. So for those patients in CR, uh, over 50% of them can achieve uh, MRD negative uh, CR, um, which would be interesting to see how that translates into long-term uh, outcome data. Um, based on this, uh, data sets and others. Uh, currently, there is a phase three study global um, uh, evaluation or investigation ongoing for patients with relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma, the sympatical study, which would compare the combination of ibrutinib venetoclax uh, with ibrutinib plus uh, placebo. Just uh, you know, uh, to uh, compare the data of venetoclax uh, alone. We talked about the combination and, and the, um, the, the rationale is based on that venetoclax as single agent has been an effective agent for a relapsed mental cell lymphoma. And this particular retrospective analysis uh, from UK basically illustrate what one would expect of the venetoclax in patients with ibrutinib uh, refractory resistant mental cell lymphoma. Um, they uh, observed a overall response rate in 50% uh, range with a CR rate of 18%. Interestingly, the median uh, progression-free survival seems to be limited at uh, three months and um, median overall survival in this very high risk population also appears to be limited at nine months. Um, so uh, again, you know, uh, venetoclax is a effective agent and could also be used to sequencing after uh, ibrutinib. However, one need to keep in mind that it's uh, probably would be used as a bridging agent with additional backup a, uh, approach uh, ready for, uh, you know, uh, consolidation and, and more long-term um, durable remission. So next, we move on to a club root nib, which is second generation BTK inhibitor. Um, we'll go very briefly here as we have, uh, you know, uh, heard from the uh, previous uh, uh, if, uh, presentation here that uh, there are difference between ibrutinib and aclabrutinib uh, in terms of the spectrum 
of target. So in the pivotal study in mental cell lymphoma, over uh, one, 124 patients uh, were treated with single agent aclarabrutinib, and here a patient had median of two prior therapies. Overall response rate was 81% with 40% patient uh, achieved uh, complete remission. The median duration response was around 14 months, and uh, common um, adverse events included headache, diarrhea, fatigue, and myalgia. It's important to note that um, the uh, hematological toxicity tend to be mild. And also in this particular data set, no atrial fibrillation was uh, observed, uh, which is to contrast with um, the, the, the result from um, ibrutinib. And here uh, you can see the progression-free survival uh, curve. Median uh, PFS was around 20 months, and two-year overall uh, survival was at 72 percent, uh, which again uh, underscore the safety and efficacy of aclabrutinib in relapse refractory mental cell lymphoma. Currently, the uh, novel agent, you know, including aclabrutinib, are being tested, incorporating into chemoimmunotherapy backbone. So here is another example of adding aclabrutinib to the backbone of BR for patients with previously untreated mental cell lymphoma. Um, the the uh, study is ongoing, uh, accruing. Um, it's important to notice and compare the um, management of various BTK inhibitors. As shown here, clinically, one need to watch out for uh, lymphocytosis, especially at the beginning of treatment, which reflect a compartment shift, uh, which is a therapeutic effect of BTK inhibitor. This happens with both ibrutinib and aclabrutinib. There's similarity in terms of side effects, including uh, bleeding, bruising risk, generally mild, um, infection risk, uh, mild cytopenias. There's also some uh, difference in terms of side effects, as mentioned earlier, such as um, uh, incidence and severity of atrial fibrillation. Again, uh, this certainly would ta uh, you know, tailor to different patient population and provide uh, treatment options based on their comorbidities. So the take-home message here is that um, BTK inhibitor represent the most uh, effective single-agent non-chemotherapy-based for treatment of mental cell lymphoma. Introduction of them into clinical practice certainly made a huge difference in terms of how we care for patient in the outpatient setting. Uh, we need to be mindful of different uh, side effects profiles and um, weighing patients' characteristic and try to match with a better uh, uh, treatment option. So uh, very quickly, we move on to do um, an analysis of immunomodulatory uh, compound um, lenalidomide. As you all know very well, um, single-agent lenalidomide have mo moderate uh, efficacy in relapse mental cell lymphoma in the range of overall uh, response rate uh, 28 to 30 percent. When you add rituximab um, in addition uh, for R-square treatment in the relapse refractory setting, the overall response rate improved to 57 percent. Um, and with a better CR rate and uh, median uh, duration of responses. In the SPRINT study, which is a randomized uh, study comparing lenalidomide with investigator's choice, the similar uh, efficacy was observed, uh, favoring lenalidomide over uh, other choices. The um, combination of lenalidomide and rituximab was also studied in the frontline setting, both as induction and maintenance. Basically, lenalidomide was given three weeks on, one week off, with rituximab given once weekly for the first month and subsequently every two cycles until progression of disease. The lenalidomide started uh, induction at higher dose of 20 milligram and reduced to 15 milligram during maintenance uh, phase, and the patient with reduced renal function would start at lower dose 
This study uh, showed high, higher effic uh, high efficacy, including um, overall response rate in the range of 90% and CR rate about 60%. The long-term data uh, was uh, recently uh, summarized, uh, which showed that um, you know progression-free survival at three years was at around 80%, and in five years, about two-thirds of patients remain to be in clinical remission. Um, as of now, we're entering about nine years for this particular trial, and about 50%, so the majority of the patients uh, continue to derive treatment benefit um, and staying CR. Interestingly, when we were uh, doing the MRD analysis with a very um, high uh, sensitivity um, uh, method, the, the clone seek, which uh, detect MRD transcript one in a million, that um, you know, eight out of ten patients, so, so about eighty percent patient can actually achieve MRD negative CR, and which probably explains you know their durable response. Basically, um, a high quality CR is. Uh, important to achieve long-term remission. Certainly, there are other ways of go getting there uh, than uh, our square regimen, and those are being experimented in clinical trial. So, to summarize, the uh, you know because it's outpatient continuous therapy, dosing and safety remains very important consideration of using lenalidomide. Uh, one need to be mindful of thromboprophylaxis and also uh, dosing modifications based on um, hematological and non-hematological parameters. Patient education would be very important for treatment compliance as well. So um, finally, uh, we will be, uh, we uh, want to talk about the CAR-T therapy, which certainly is a brand new modality uh, treatment for uh, lymphoma and, and particularly for mental cell lymphoma. So as you all know, um, the CAR T cell essentially is a, a living um, agent uh, cellular therapy uh, with uh, T cells that are transduced with genetically modified construct, the chimeric antigen receptor. It started by uh, collecting uh, T cells from patients with leukophoresis and subsequently um, engineer the chimeric re uh, antigen receptors and ex vivo expansion and finally uh, infuse back to the patient after cytoreductive uh, conditioning regimen. The process takes about uh, three, four weeks. Um, and currently, you know, there are two uh, products that, that are FDA approved in, on the market for indication of relapse, refractory, diffuse, large B-cell lymphoma, the axial cell and the T-cell cell, and with the lesal cell in the process of going through regulatory reviews. Um, it certainly has tremendous potential, as we have witnessed with patient relapsed uh, refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It certainly comes with, um, you know, it, its own toxicity, which are very unique. The cytokine release syndromes, the neurological toxicities, which require very intensive monitoring and supportive care. Um, the uh, preliminary data in mental cell lymphoma appears to be very promising, although in very early stage. Uh, shown here are uh, small data sets coming from the Transcend Non-Hodgkin Lymphoma 001 study, where um, th 17 patients uh, received the lethal cell um, CAR T cell product at two dosing level. Collectively, um, treatment achieved 71% overall response rate with 53 uh, CR rate, which is quite remarkable in this cohort of patients with very high risk disease. Many of them are refractory to um, uh, BTK inhibitors. Again, it's a very short follow-up and, and um, requiring a longer um, uh, follow up as well as a larger study and perhaps a more dedicated MCL specific study. 
Um, one such study is the Zuma 2 uh, study, which is ongoing, and it utilized the Kite X19 product um, for patients with relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. Majority of them are high risk uh, refractory to previous treatment, including transplant and BTK inhibitor. And uh, we're awaiting the uh, outcome of the study efficacy data. Um, with anticipation, and, um, and hopefully those data would become available um, for evaluation and discussion very soon. To summarize, you know, um, major advance has uh, is certainly taken place for patients with mental cell lymphoma, and the advancement of novel agents uh, led by the BTK inhibitors, including ibrutinib, aclabrutinib, uh, with others such as BCL2 inhibitor and R square regimen, certainly uh, made significant uh, contribution to bring very effective outpatient based, generally well tolerated regimen to all patients with mental cell lymphoma. However, um, mental cell lymphoma remains incurable which represents challenges, but as well as opportunities. Um, there are numerous clinical trials are ongoing, which uh, evaluate personalized combination treatment uh, with novel agents. And um, for, for those combinations which have high efficacy uh, outcome, uh, the, that also present opportunities to uh, consider uh, response adapted treatment, such as um, you know a fixed duration treatment or um, you know intensity adjustment based on uh, response. In doing so, one would uh, try to minimize side effects associated with treatment. In the meantime, continue to deliver high efficacy and preserve quality of life for patients with mental cell lymphoma. One example is to consider MRD testing um, to uh, adapt uh, treatment duration as well as intensity. And finally, other agent, uh, including immunotherapy such as CAR T cells, are really uh, on the horizon, uh, although in early stage, which could potentially provide uh, a very effective uh, treatment for patients, especially for those with very high risk uh, disease features or chemotherapy resistance. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gia. That was very nice. I, we have time uh, for just a few um, uh, questions. So, Ryan, let's. There's, there's a number of questions here about combining um, a BTK inhibitor with a BCL2 inhibitor, and where do we think this is going? I guess the other, along that same line, there was a question specifically about the accommodation of a CALA and a VEN that was presented by the Ohio State Group in 2017. But any update on that data, and um, and where do you, and just about that, those combos in general? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> and before talking about the, the you know the the response numbers, the combination is exciting in CLL. Uh, because of one, where the the separate agents hit uh, the CLL disease uh, in, in in the patient, so uh, BTK inhibition is is uh, extremely effective at uh, targeting disease in the lymph nodes, uh, in in spleen and uh, and and, a, and bone marrow as well. You know, I've had patients tell me the next day after starting a BTK inhibitor that their painful lymph nodes are, are already feeling better. Um, venetoclax targets uh, or hits um, circulating disease quite uh, effectively and quickly, and we, of course, know that BTK inhibition can lead to very prolonged lymphocytosis. So where they hit the disease uh, uh, works well uh, in conjunction together. Also, uh, preclinically, it's been shown perhaps uh, they reduce um, uh, escape uh, mechanisms, mechanisms of um, resistance. Uh, for example, BTK inhibition seems to downregulate MCL1 production, which is a potential mechanism of, of resistance uh, for, for um, venetoclax. So that's the kind of exciting um, 
some exciting information about the combination preclinically, and then and, and in terms of what's been published already, the, the uh, MD Anderson group looked at high-risk patients and it, with this combination, and it showed high levels of activity. Again, well, you'll have to stay tuned um, to Ash this year about looking at this combination given together for a year in the frontline setting for for not just high risk but but all all patients um, and then long term um, we're going to have some answers on whether uh, it looks like you can stop both agents uh, or uh, you should just maybe stop in the MRD negative patients and continue the others. Um, so we're going to get some more answers to, to these questions uh, long term. But of course, um, if, if a brutinib and venetoclax works, it's, it's not a, a big leap to think that a calibrutinib and venetoclax would work as well. And there are uh, ongoing studies looking at that combination uh, too. But, but not FDA approved yet, so not something we could, we could bring to the clinic just yet. Great, Gia. So, um, in lymphoma and specific, in, in mantle cell lymphoma specifically, and the use of CAR T cells, you know, what about the use of BTK inhibitors or IMIDs as sort of um, primers prior to uh, in the CAR T cell? We've seen data in CLL with with uh, BTK inhibitors. Any thoughts or data on that? Um, I think it's very interesting, and uh, certainly it's very preliminary. Um, you know. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the CAR-T uh, trial population currently, you know, really target those with uh, quite resistant disease, you know, including those with um, ibrutinib failure or ibrutinib resistance. Um, whether, you know, um, this could be used slightly earlier um, and, uh, um, you know, especially for those uh, patients with high risk uh, genetic features and um, in combination with, you know, uh, hitting them together with ibrutinib um, versus lenalidomide as um, cytoreduction reduc agent. I guess your question also asking if they would contributing to the immune um, kind of synergy uh, with CAR T cell. Um, I hope they do. I just don't know if there's any particular, um, you know, data on those, especially for the mental cell lymphoma setting. I think there are discussions about perhaps uh, looking at, you know, primings or uh, su subsequent, you know, additional um, immune modulating. Um, but that would be interesting to see. I mean, certainly the data in CLL and that was presented was pretty impressive that, um, and whether that's just because you're getting better disease control and adding the, the CAR T cell on top of it, I think, you know, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, unclear. There's a question here about um, biospecifics and where we think they're going. I'll take a stab and then we can ask you guys what you think. I mean, um, the, there's um, a number of different biospecifics that are, that are being, um, being developed. Um, predominantly CD20 so far with uh, CD3. Um, and I've been uh, really quite impressed with those, e either as single agent or in combination with um, other agents such as checkpoint inhibitors. There's also quite excitement. I mean, the notion here is that you're going to have sort of an off the shelf uh, CAR T cell um, type of therapy where you don't have to wait for, the, for develop a, a personalized product for someone where you have this immunotherapy that um, brings the T cell. Uh, to the malignant B cell and causes the, the immunological synapse. And so you know, a lot of data has been, been exciting so far. Now there's subsequent trials trying, trying to combine it with, with uh, other agents, either with chemotherapy or a, antibody drug conjugates. Uh, you know, Ryan, you've been doing some of these studies. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's been nice to see patients that have progressed on so many other treatments that have um, that I've observed on these uh, bispecifics that have been able to uh, get a response. I think, like um, you were saying, the ex some exciting combinations, for example, there's a bispecific plus polituzumab or a bispecific plus um, RCHOP. Um, the toxicity seemed to be uh, manageable from, from, from the experience I've had. Um, it's, it, it doesn't seem to be as, as hard to give as, say, blinatumumab. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've, I've had a positive experience with it. Um, okay, then one, one very difficult question, um, but we're going to end with this. 
And um, so what about dose in intensity with ibrutinib, since most of the side effects are, are dose-related? I'm going to ask both of you, because maybe it's different in mantle cell lymphoma than, than CLL. Interesting publication from MD Anderson, small number of patients, but it would suggest that the higher dose level is needed up front uh, to really um, hit the disease um, when it's uh, prior to any, you get any cytoreduction in to uh, have best effect, but then quickly thereafter, um, they feel that it's possible that you could reduce down uh, to, to 140 uh, for long-term treatment, and perhaps with that, still maintain long-term disease control and reduce toxicities at the lower dose. And, and there are um, long-term follow-up studies that have looked at patients that have had to reduce dose due to toxicities, and they've been able to maintain disease control. Um, so I'm not doing it in practice, uh, but, but I, I will be interested um, that they, they've taken it to a larger group of patients to investigate. Uh, so, yeah. so, Gia, in, in mantle cell, we're already using a higher dose. And, of course, in the original phase one, we went to much, there much higher doses were used. Mm -hmm. So do you think it makes a difference in, is it different in mantle cell, or do you think the well, same? I, I would like to think that, you know, in, in principle, I uh, s certainly want to watch out for side effects and, and try to adjust uh, based on that. But, you know, on the other hand, mantle cell lymphoma tend to be more aggressive and a lot of people come in with quite active disease, and we worry about uh, treatment resistance. So I think, you know, to have 100% possible blockade uh, of the uh, enzyme using the inhibitor, we would try to aim for that. So yes, we generally stay with f 560, um, and for as long as we could. And again, you know, if there are um, uh, room for uh, adjustment, especially in those patients who has really great response. Um, it's possible, you know, just to accommodate uh, lower dose. I, I think w we've, um, we've done trials with other combinations, and especially in, you know, phase 1B portion where uh, we start ramping up, and I think, you know, 280 would be the lowest that we would have tried. Um, but I, I wouldn't start or do anything uh, too prematurely in patient who's on just conventional treatment with ibrutinib. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, with that, I think we're going to come to a close. I want to thank the faculty uh, for being here and their presentations, the audience for your participation. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash RZK860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Celgene Corporation, Pharmacyclics LLC, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.